Howdy folks and welcome back to War Thunder with the Mighty Jingles. I have been paying an awful lot of attention to World of Tanks lately, uh, and I make no apologies for that, it's not every day patch 9.3 goes up on the test server, but World of Tanks has had more than enough attention lately. And it's been a while since I gave you a War Thunder video. And uh, that's what we're getting today. This is Little Nasty, and he's flying his F8F1 Bearcat in a realistic battle on the Berlin map against the Germans. The skin that you can see being used here on this F8F Bearcat is obviously a custom skin. It's the VFA 103 Jolly Rogers US Navy Fighter Squadron skin. Now, the Bearcat was never operated by the Jolly Rogers, but I really, really like this skin. I got it from War Thunder Live, War Thunder's community site. I would love to be able to tell you exactly where to download it from, but until they actually put a search function on War Thunder Live, I'm afraid all I can do is uh, tell you to use Google. Now, in this realistic battle, Little Nasty is going to be going up against hordes of HE-162 jet fighters. However, the HE-162 has a very, very early jet engine design, and it was experience with the HE-162 which led German engineers to start putting two jet engines on their early jet fighters, like the ME-262. In this realistic battle, Little Nasty is going to run up against hordes of HE-162 Volksjäger jet fighters. Now, before you get too excited, the HE-162 was designed to be a cheap, mass-produced, inexpensive jet fighter to be flown by the Hitler Youth. Um, in the actual event, only 200 of them ever left their factories, and most of those were lost to operational issues like running out of fuel, crashing, structural failures, engine flameouts, things like that. The Bearcat, on the other hand, had quite an impressive pedigree going back through Grubben's CAT series of fighters like the F6 Hellcat back to the F4 Wildcat, and it could be argued that in a lot of ways this aircraft was the pinnacle of United States piston-engined aircraft design. The basic design requirements for the Bearcat were to get a very powerful Pratt & Whitney Double Wasp radial piston engine into as small an airframe as possible, and they succeeded beyond their wildest dreams in that respect. If you were to compare the Bearcat directly to the Hellcat, it was superior in almost every respect. It was a much, much smaller design, so it had better storage and use capability on the US Navy's aircraft and escort carriers. It had better deck handling. Its performance was better. It was 20% lighter, about 50 miles per hour faster, and had a 30% better rate of climb. It was also no slouch in the maneuverability and low altitude performance areas, areas which the Hellcat, while being a great and very, very capable fighter, uh, was not particularly famous for. The US Navy at the time was felt to have a performance gap when it came to low altitude, um, which was exemplified by the problems that the Hellcat had at low altitude trying to intercept kamikaze bombers going for American carriers and surface ships. This was something that the Grumman engineers were determined would not be a problem for the Bearcat. The initial armament of the Bearcat, four M250 caliber machine guns, was at the time considered perfectly adequate, as well as keeping the weight down and therefore increasing performance, but while the Bearcat was being designed, the major enemy that it was going to go into battle against were the Japanese A6M20 series of aircraft aircraft, none of which were particularly well armoured, which was a necessary part of the design of the Zeros because the engines weren't particularly powerful, and in order to meet performance standards, they had to give up things like self-sealing fuel tanks and armoured engines and cockpits. 50 caliber machine guns were entirely capable of wrecking Zeros. However, new Japanese aircraft were being developed with significantly more powerful engines and therefore better performance and the capacity to include silly little things like armour and self-sealing fuel tanks. So the inclusion of four 20mm cannons was swiftly incorporated into the Bearcat's design. There was one other relatively simple and easy to overlook design change between the Bearcat and its predecessors, the Hellcat and the Wildcat, that did go a long way towards making this aircraft a much more capable fighter, and that was the simple inclusion of a bubble canopy. This was the first Grumman fighter aircraft to include a bubble canopy and not have the Razorback design of the fuselage behind the cockpit, which made it very difficult for the pilot to see what was going on behind him. It seems pretty obvious that it's a very, very good idea for a fighter aircraft to have the capability for the pilot to be able to see what's going on all around him, but this was the first Grumman aircraft to have a bubble canopy and not 
have the Razorback fuselage design, which made it practically impossible for the pilot to see what was going on in his rear quarter. And simple little things like that, often overlooked, are one of the things that make the difference between a good fighter and a great fighter. There was one other very unusual design feature of the Bearcat that was swiftly rejected and never made it into the final production versions. It had explosive, detachable wingtips. The idea was that since the Bearcat was so incredibly fast, it was feared that the aircraft might lose its wings in high-speed dives, and so structural weaknesses were built into the wingtips, with the idea being that it was better to lose the wingtips than to lose an entire wing. In the event that only one of the wingtips sheared off due to uh, structural pressure at high speeds, explosive bolts were built into both of the wingtips so the pilot could detonate the other wingtip and therefore maintain flight symmetry. Unfortunately, this is another one of those ideas that sounds great in principle, but not too hot in practice. On two occasions, the wingtips sheared off during low altitude, high speed pullout maneuvers, and both aircraft flipped over, crashed into the sea before the pilots could recover, killing them both. Also, on at least one occasion, US Navy ground crew were killed while doing maintenance on the aircraft, and the explosive bolts detonated prematurely. Unsurprisingly, and this was not a design feature that made it into the production versions of the Bearcat. We're just going to interrupt the history lesson here for a moment because Little Nasty has finally got in combat range of his first enemy jet, who has the advantages, he's in a head-on. He has the height and the energy advantage, he's going into a dive, he managed to avoid the head-on fire. He's never going to catch an HE-162 in a dive. I mean, the Bearcat is fast in a dive, but this is a jet. And the HE-162 pilot is not particularly stupid either. He's not trying to outmaneuver a Bearcat and he's leading him toward a whole mess of enemy fighters including multiple other HE-162s. Little Nasty is going to have to choose his targets with care here. There's an HE-162 over there and it's not the one he's going for. There's another one just about to pass in front of him. There he goes. That's his target. Opens up the 20 mils, hits him, sets him on fire. He's not going to chase him down because he has spotted another target. It's another 162. He's got him. He's definitely got him. He is never going to pull out of that. He, it's safe to leave him alone. Then there's another one. <laughs> wow. Little Nasty's Bearcat just scored three jet kills in the space of less than a minute. That was some very impressive shooting. Well, while he's uh, catching his breath, patting himself on the back and looking around for his next victim, let's just take a look at the raw performance numbers of the F-8F Bearcat. It was a very, very small aircraft. It was only 28.25 feet long, 35.83 feet wide, and 13.7 feet tall. Empty, it only weighed 7,000 pounds. It was powered by a single Pratt & Whitney 2,100 horsepower double wasp 18 cylinder engine. A maximum speed of 421 miles per hour. A maximum range of only 1,105 miles which was going to be a significant problem for the performance of the aircraft when it did eventually get into combat. It had a service ceiling of 38,698 feet and could climb at 4,500 feet per minute. As already mentioned, the initial armament of the aircraft was limited to just four M2 50 caliber Browning machine guns. However, the F8F1B version of the Bearcat was ordered with 20mm cannons instead. The aircraft was also capable of mounting four 127mm rockets or a single 1,000 pound bomb. Although obviously this would always have the cost of further reducing the aircraft's maximum operational range. However, the ability to carry bombs and rockets and the great low altitude performance of the Bearcat meant that as well as being an exceptionally good fighter aircraft, it was also pretty good in the close air support role. And this is where the Bearcat first saw combat service, just not in World War II. The Bearcat never saw service in any of the operational theatres of war during the Second World War. But it did see service in the Indochina War, where it was flown by the French Air Force in the close air support role. The French pilots loved this aircraft. They loved that it was so maneuverable and stable at low altitudes that they could dive right down the throat of winding, narrow Vietnamese valleys 
hit the target and do a high G pull up right at the end and get clear with ease. They absolutely adored this aircraft. Let's not of course forget that during the Indochina War the French Air Force didn't have any credible opposition in the air whatsoever. And so obviously the Bearcat was mostly going to be used for ground support, but it was very very good in the role. The only issue that they had was once again the limited range, which was a significant problem in Vietnam. The Bearcat also had the dubious distinction of being one of the few aircraft to be used by both the North and South Vietnamese Air Forces. Surviving French Bearcats were eventually passed on for service into the newly formed Vietnamese Air Force in 1955. And Vietnam were not the only Southeast Asian nation to use Bearcats. A number were sold to the Royal Thai Air Force and Thailand actually kept their Bearcats in service until 1960. The Bearcat also set a number of aviation performance records. In 1946, an F-8F, after a takeoff run of only 115 feet, set a new time to climb record when it reached 10,000 feet in just 94 seconds. Unfortunately for the Bearcat, it really didn't have a glorious combat history, and that's not through any fault of the aircraft itself. It was just that when it did get involved in shooting wars, it was either, in the case of the French in Indochina, going up against absolutely no air opposition, or in the case of America in the Korean War, the Bearcat had already been eclipsed by Grumman's latest aircraft design, the F-9F Panther, and McDonnell Douglas's Banshee. And so the poor old Bearcat never really got a chance to shine. And so it's a bit of a shame because while it's very easy to pinpoint and identify any number of great BF-109, Fokker Wolf 190, Mustang, uh, Spitfire, hell even great Stuka pilots, it's not so easy to identify great Bearcat pilots and not through any fault of the aircraft. It's just that when the aircraft did see operational combat it was mostly limited to the ground support role either because there were no enemy fighters for it to shoot down or because it had been replaced in the fighter role by more capable, more modern jets. But there were nevertheless some great and famous pilots who flew the Bearcat. Uh, Corky Meyer, Grumman's test pilot for example, and also, and not very widely known, the first man on the moon, Neil Armstrong, when he was a pilot in the Air Force, flew the Bearcat, and is reported to have said that he enjoyed flying the Bearcat more than any other aircraft he ever got his hands on the controls of. But while it's definitely fair to say the Bearcat never really had the chance to have an illustrious combat history, it is definitely an aircraft with a fantastic pedigree in the area of civilian aircraft racing. The world-famous Reno Air Race has pretty much been dominated by the Bearcat for decades since Miro Slovak first won it in 1964 flying a completely stock Bearcat. Since then, other pilots, most notably Lyle Shelton flying a heavily modified version of the F-8F called the Rare Bear and Daryl Greenamer also flying a Bearcat named the Conquest One who between the two of them have basically won the Reno Air Race every year for decades. Between them, setting numerous records along the way, including the 3km world speed record for piston-driven aircraft, 528.33 miles per hour, set in 1989, and a new time to climb record, 3000 meters in 91.9 seconds, breaking the 1946 record set by, you guessed it, another Bearcat. But notwithstanding the Bearcat's success as a civilian race aircraft, it's still a shame that this is probably one of the finest combat fighter aircraft ever developed that never really got the chance to fight in combat. And it was the last piston engine fighter aircraft that Grumman would ever produce after this. They went for the F-9 Panther, which obviously was a jet engine fighter, and have never really looked back since. All of which brings us to Berlin Tempelhof Airport, and Little Nasty is doing a very, very dangerous ground attack run on the last remaining enemy pilot in the HE-162 and he's got him while he's rearming and repairing and now he's got to get the hell out of here and wait for that ticket counter to run down while dodging dozens of flak batteries at Berlin Tempelhof. Get a load of this. <laughs> One hell of a game here by Little Nasty in the F-8F Bearcat taking down four HE-162 jet fighters in a realistic battle here in War Thunder. So a round of applause please for Little Nasty and his Bearcat flying a great game. And uh, as always, I hope you enjoyed the video. Watch your six, and I'll catch you next time.